Well, thank you so much for being here. This is the key takeaway of the Pharmacy Residency Accreditation Standard Revision. I'm Julie Dagum. I'm with uh, Advocate Aurora Health in Wisconsin. And I've had the absolute pleasure of being on the Commission on Credentialing while we've undertaken the revision of the standard. And I've also had the absolute pleasure of working with the standard revision team. Um, so I'm really, really happy to be here and to be able to present some information about the standard revision. Um, I also have some partners in crime here that have also been part of the standard revision team, so I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Andrea Robertson. I'm the Director of Process and Quality Improvement with Accreditation Services at ASHP. I'm Jim Carlson, one of the lead surveyors at ASHP. And I'm Akila Strader. I've been with ASHP 12 years as a lead surveyor. All right, so we can go ahead and get started. Really, the format of this session is we have um, a couple of slides to, to really summarize the, the key takeaways of the, the standard revision, but we also want to leave some time for questions and, and things like that. So you'll see there are a couple of microphones in the middle of the rows. So when we get to that part of questions, if you could make your way to a microphone, that would be really helpful as well. Um, but let's get into a little bit of the summary before we open it up for questions and for your feedback. All right, just to review the standard revision process, and, and this is something that it, it always helped, helped us to ground us when we were in our standard revision meetings to revisit the big picture goals that we set. And these were big picture goals that when we first undertook the standard revision process, we set out to say, all right, what are, what are our goals when we do this revision? And we knew that we needed to address preceptor qualifications and really take a deep dive into preceptor qualifications because that was something that we heard a lot of feedback about with the current standard. Um, as the, the lifetime of that current standard went on. And so we really wanted to make sure that we spent some focused time addressing preceptor qualifications. One of our other really big goals was to simplify or eliminate um, some of the duplicates that are in the existing standard. And we really, really tried to make this, the revised standard very clear, very easy to understand, and, and really have a lot of, of guidance from that standpoint, but really to eliminate some of the multiple places where things might occur in the standard. I think the really big piece and, and the, the huge part of this standard revision is to harmonize all four of the existing standards into one standard. And that was something that we knew was going to be really, really important. And hopefully everyone is really happy with the final product, but we're really excited about it because this harmonized standard takes the PGY-1 pharmacy residency standard. It is, it harmonizes it with the PGY-1 community pharmacy, with PGY-1 managed care, and with all PGY-2 programs. So all pharmacy residency programs, regardless of type, are on a single standard, which has a lot of advantages and is a, a really fantastic um, update. We also wanted to make sure that the standards reflected current and um, future practice and in, in that type of thing. So we wanted to insert concepts of well-being and resilience as well as concepts of diversity and inclusion into the standard. And we took a look at pharmacy services and wanted to refresh those pharmacy services. Again, because pharmacy residency training, we want our residents to be um, learning in a best practice environment and really our pharmacy residency programs, and all of you guys, do so much to push the profession forward with your residency training programs, and that pharmacy services really helps to support that. So we wanted to refresh the pharmacy services and really focus on what's fundamental and unique to pharmacy and to pharmacy practice as we did that. So those were our really kind of five big picture goals when um, we started the revision process and kept us grounded as we went through the, the revision process. All right, we have a, a couple different versions of this graphic, but this is a very simplified version of the timeline of the standard revision. So it started in August of 2019. This is when we began our, our revision work. Um, leading up to just about a year ago, December of 2021, the first standard revision draft was completed and available for programs for comment. So right around this time last year, right after the mid-year, the standard draft went out and we really, really appreciate all of the comments and all the time that people took to review and to provide comments in the open feedback period. Um, that was from open from or December of 2021 to January of 2022. That was the open comment period. During that time, we got over 1,800 individual comments on standards and our standard revision team between 
January and May of 2022, I can assure you we looked at absolutely every single comment that was submitted through that survey, and we really thoughtfully tried to address and, and insert any of, of those pieces. So thank you to all of you who provided that feedback. Know that it was heard, know that we read it, and we talked about it, and we, we did something about it. So that's um, why it took a little bit with the, the revision process piece. Um, but then that brought us to May, um, to May through August of 2022. That was our approval process of the revised standards. So it first went to the commission for approval, and then we had different um, boards of uh, approval, including the ASHP board of directors and our partner organizations and such. So that brings us to the exciting part. All programs implement the new standard with the 2023-2024 class. Um, so I know everyone's excited about that and also why you're all here. So, so thank you for being here with that as well. Okay, the next couple of slides, I'm just gonna go through the standards, a, a very high level overview of some of the things that we thought about, some of the bigger changes that you might see in the standard and go through those and then we'll open it up for questions and, and try to provide some context and things like that. So standard one is the recruitment and selection of residents. Um, in terms of things that really focused in standard one, we added language surrounding the recruitment selection process and promoting diversity and inclusion. And actually this is the very first thing when you look at the standard, I think it's 1.1, um, talks about the diversity and inclusion in the recruitment process of the residents. <clears throat> also in standard one, we added requirements for programs to address all phases of the match. So in terms of having a process, not just for phase one of the match, but also for phase two, and if you're a PGY2 program, for the early commit process and, and those types of things, which um, hadn't really previously been spelled out as well in the standard, and now are, are spelled out hopefully a lot more and a lot clearer from that standpoint. So that's some of the things that we did also to, to really try to address and, and simplify and make it really clear what the intent of the standards were. We also added language pertinent to international programs because international programs are surveyed on this standard as well. Um, so standard one kind of covers that whole recruitment and selection of residents and those are really kind of the, the big picture things that either um, stand out in standard one or that we really adjusted in standard one. Standard two is program requirements and policies. And I, um, we, we got feedback that supports this, but, but we think that we did a really good job spelling out a lot of the policies that are required in residency programs and really trying to provide guidance for what that looks like when those policies are provided to candidates interested in the program and, and really tried to, to provide additional guidance for that. Um, I think sometimes in the, the current standard, it was hard to tell what did you need a policy for or those kinds of things like that. And this kind of, try, we tried to pull it all together so it was really clear. So some of the things that we did in standard two is that we clarified the minimum term of appointment and the maximum time away from the program and consequences. Um, before going on, I know that there has been a lot of chatter of the max, maximum time away from the program that is in the standard. <laughs> and, I, and I just wanna say if your current leave policies and your current time away from the program policies don't exceed 37 days, you don't have to do anything different with your policies. This was just to provide some framework around the amount of time that somebody could be away from the residency program without having to make up time. Um, so that was really the intent of the minimum term of appointments and the maximum time away from the residency program. Um, we also added and clarified requirements for documentation of duty hours. And that was a, a, hopefully a, a fantastic update because we also updated the duty hour policy as we went through the, the standard. So there's a new duty hour policy that's out there and this revised standard um, really matches up with that duty hour policy. So um, kudos to those that worked on the duty hour policy and uh, made some really great enhancements to that duty hour policy. And we think that the standard now really helps mirror what is in that duty hour policy so that you know exactly what's required for documentation. Um, also wanna say too, Farm Academic now has the ability for you to do the attestations of duty hours right already built in, which I think a lot of people have really, really appreciated. I've heard a lot of feedback about, oh, that's really, really great. And I'm seeing a lot of head nods, so I'm gonna take that as positive reinforcement. <laughs> All right, in standard two, we also specified expectation for minimum completion requirements. 
um, for the percentage of achieve for the residency and rating scale definitions by the program. And some of these things aren't necessarily new to the standard, but they are just more clarified in the standard and it makes it more clear that that's the expectation with that. So it's not that the current standard had no expectations for completion requirements or things like that, but the new standard, we, we intended to make it more clear about what needs to go in those completion requirements and what programs need to think about. Um, but still balancing that with the ability for programs to, to personalize their completion requirements to their program. Um, so the completion requirements, like we said, um, the achieve for the residency rating scale definitions and the deliverables are like the work products that residents are going to do that are related to the objectives. Um, so there's some more clarity as to how that flows into the completion requirements. Um, standard two, we also clarified the required residency policies and other documentation. Like I said, um, it, it hopefully makes it very clear what policies um, we'd like programs to have and updated the information that the programs provide and the timing parameters to candidates that are invited to interview to match candidates and to the residents upon starting. So hopefully that makes it a bit more clear in the standard what needs to go to who and when. But I will say as a general observation, we tried to move a lot of that more upstream in the process. So really making sure that candidates that are interested in the residency programs get a lot of those policies when they're invited to interview so that they can take a look at things like your leave policy or they can take a look at things like your completion requirements or your start date or those kinds of things like that and look at that and say, hey, you know what, that's not going to work for me or that's going to be really difficult for me to do and, and to make sure that they have all that information up front before they come and interview and, and those kinds of things. Um, but the other piece of it too is it's also a conversation that you have during the interview to make sure that they understand all of, all of the expectations that you're going to have for them in their residency program. So I will say that those, um, that information, we tried to make it more clear, and we tried to move some of those things more upstream in the process, which we think will really help support programs and residents. <clears throat> we also added a requirement for a residency manual, which I think a lot of programs had a residency manual anyways, but um, it never really was spelled out in the standard, so that is something that is new in the standard, is the requirement to have a residency manual but we also provided in the guidance some of the things that you ought to consider putting in your residency manual as well. Um, so if you're looking to, if you're a new program, and you're like, oh, I need a residency manual, what should I be putting in it? The standard is the perfect way to start and has some guidance there. Um, we also added some parameters for financial support and resources, and that's also new to the standard as it relates to financial support from a residency standpoint. Now, it doesn't dictate how much or those kinds of things, but it does dictate that you're upfront with what that looks like for your program so that it's really clear and transparent to candidates and, and there's no misunderstanding or those kinds of things. Okay, that um, is standard two in a very short nutshell. <laughs> Moving on to standard three, which is really kind of the, you know, the, the bread and butter of what you're gonna be doing in your residency program. So that's the design, the conduct, the structure of the residency program. Um, some adjustments that we made in standard three, we added additional guidance for programs to place emphasis on the depth and breadth of experiences that are offered in the residency program. And we also really shored up some of the core components of the program design and making sure that the program structure facilitates achievement of all of the objectives. Now, it doesn't mean that the residents have to ACHR every objective that's determined by you and your completion requirements. But you have to set up your program so that um, it sets it up to achieve all of the objectives, right? So you're covering all of the objectives with adequate repetition, with adequate depth and breadth, and those types of things when you structure your residency program. Um, the other piece that we added in is that um, since the current standard um, was developed, there was a CAGO revision, and in this CAGO revision, a lot of um, program types is competency areas and goals and objectives also had a required maybe disease state appendix or those kinds of things. And if you're a PGY2 program, you're probably familiar with tracking that and, and all of that. Um, that is something that we added into the standard in terms of making sure that all of the appendix is covered and that it's tracked appropriately and, and those kinds of things. So not something different from what you're probably doing, but just now very clear in the standard that it is being done. 
And we also added some guidance to place emphasis on patient care. So if you're a direct patient care program, um, looking at the amount of time that's spent in patient care and, and those kinds of things like that. Um, we also clarified the relationship between the CAGOs and the standard. As I had described, um, the CAGOs being the objectives that you are teaching and your learning experiences and that type of thing. But we tried to make it more clear how those CAGOs relate to the standard, but also how the, that information is taught to residents, right? So that residents understand what do we mean when we're talking about the standard or the competency areas, goals and objectives and, and those kinds of things. Um, and like I said, we added expectations for completion and, or completing and tracking the required CAGO appendix um, for those programs that have a required appendix in their CAGOs. Standard 3 also got a very um, deep dive look into development plans. And that's something I think that is maybe one of the biggest adjustments that you'll see in the standard revision, particularly in Standard 3 is we really looked at development plans and tried to refresh them, update them. We looked at what programs are doing for development plans out there when we're on surveys and, and that type of thing, and really tried to think about how that development plan fits into the training of the resident and how that's really um, their, their guide for what their year is going to be. So we looked at everything related to development plans and we got lots of feedback on development plans and, and all of those types of things. So we looked at timing, we looked at resident progression. We really wanted to make sure that the, or the development plans link back to the competency areas, goals and objectives. We tried to incorporate concepts of continuous professional development in the updated expectations for the development plans. And part of that is because we wanted to make sure that those concepts of assessing and figuring out where gaps are and how those gaps are going to be closed or addressed or changed or those kinds of things is a skill that we're teaching our residents to be able to do once they finish the residency program to be able to do that in their career as well. So we took some concepts of, of CPD and incorporated that into the refreshed development plans. Um, we incorporated some resident self-assessment um, which again I think some programs were already doing and, and really doing a fantastic job with that. Um, we incorporated an expectation for resident self-assessment as part of the development plan. And that's also where we inserted some concepts of well-being and, and assessment for the resident to assess their well-being and for the RPD to be able to help support that. Um, we also looked at evaluations, timing and frequency updated. We also um, made it clear that the evaluations will require input from all of the preceptors that are associated with that particular learning experience. Um, but otherwise, aside from timing and frequency and from kind of the evaluation piece as it relates to preceptor input, I don't know that there's significant changes related to the evaluation piece. Um, one of the other really big things that we did in Standard 3 as part of the harmonization process is that for PGY1 community-based pharmacy residency programs, in the existing standard, there are some required core services that live in Standard 3 for PGY1 community pharmacy residency programs. When we harmonize, we removed those requirements for those specific services in the standard and those will be addressed in the CAGOs as the CAGOs are revised. So that represents a pretty significant change for those folks that are in PGY1 community pharmacy residency programs, but it was a really important and really critical part of the harmonizing of all of the program types into one standard. All right. So that covered standard three, which is crazy to think about that we talked about the whole design and conduct of a residency program in a couple minutes or less, but onto the highlights of standard four. Um, standard four is the requirements of the RPD and the preceptors. Um, this is, a, we spent a very significant amount of time on standard four. In fact, actually standard four is where we started when we started the revision process because we knew we wanted to look at RPD qualifications and eligibility. We knew we wanted to look at preceptor eligibility and, qual um, and, and qualifications and make sure that we took feedback that we had heard. Um, so we updated RPD el eligibility and qualifications. We added um, the interim RPD, which is a new sort of piece that can happen. We added that to guidance. Um, we also really defined program oversight and, and that, I think, got a bit of a refreshment in terms of how the oversight of the program works in terms of committee or committees. We really lean towards being able to make sure that if there are 
organizations that support multiple residency programs, that there's a way that, that those programs can work together from a committee oversight. But clarified expectations specifically um, to make sure that there still remains a mechanism or a process for individual resident progression and for individual program decisions to be made. Um, so we allowed a committee or committees to be established to provide oversight for the residency programs. We also clarified expectations for program quality improvement. I think um, it's more clear in the standard now that the quality improvement related to the residency programs is not just the annual program review that happens at the end of the year, but it's also continuous if you kind of think about it as formative as well as summative um, for both uh, program improvements and those kinds of things. So I think it makes it a little bit more clear in the standard and the guidance. And then we also clarified preceptor appointments and reappointment and the schedule for that. So we updated that schedule for preceptor appointments and reappointment to be at least every four years, and that really was to match the, the new eight-year cycle that is now in place with the current standard. When the current standard came out, the accreditation cycle was six years. Um, now the accreditation cycle is eight years, so that every four years kind of matches with that accreditation cycle. All right, we also updated preceptor eligibility and qualifications. Um, some of the things that I, we've heard really great feedback from people is that um, we, well, I'll first say that we adjusted the different components of preceptor qualifications. Um, so we looked at the first component being content expertise, um, that there's a lot of different things that can meet content expertise, but for those preceptors that were using years of experience to meet content expertise in the current standard, it's 10 years. In the new standard, it's reduced to five years. So I think that's um, an adjustment that, that many people were pleased to see in the new standard. Um, we also, the contributions to practice and role modeling, so kind of the three buckets that preceptor qualifications fall in is content expertise, contributions to practice, and role modeling are kind of the three sections of preceptor qualifications. For the contributions to practice and role modeling, we did shorten that to be within the past four years, the examples occurring within the past four years instead of in the current standards, it's within the past five years. And again, the reason for that is because A, we expanded the, the types of things that could count, if you will, for each of those areas, but we also wanted to make sure that it aligned really nicely with the accreditation cycle of eight years. And like I said, we adjusted each type of the qualification, so now kind of the buckets are content, knowledge, and expertise, contribution to pharmacy practice, and then role modeling ongoing professional engagement. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to think of every possible example that might happen in terms of, hey, does, would this count for role modeling professional engagement? Would this count for this? So the guidance is, is really expanded in the new standard as it relates to that, but hopefully the intent of what those pieces mean is a lot more clear in the new standard. Um, certainly, I, I don't think that we were able to ever think of every single situation that could come up, but I think that the standard gives a more specific guidance into what the intent of what those sections mean. Um, in standard four, we also defined preceptor active practice and ongoing responsibilities, and we eliminated the preceptor and training designation um, in the current standard, there's, it's almost a requirement that if somebody doesn't meet the eligibility and qualifications and they are going to precept in your program, that you make them a preceptor in training and give them a plan to meet within two years. Um, in the current, or in the new standard, in the standard revision, the piece of having a development plan for where it is or how the, the preceptor is going to meet the qualifications in two years, that still exists but making them a designated preceptor in training, that language has been removed from the standard. And I think that's also something that we heard a lot of comments about and got a lot of feedback, so really appreciated that. All right, other components of standard for um, everyone's favorite document, the academic and professional record, um, that is also updated and available on the ASHP website along with the, the revised standard. So just to be clear, the updated academic and professional record that is out on the website that's in the same geographical location is where you'd find the, new, the revised standard. 
that academic and professional record matches the revised standard. So since I said we, we went through and we really tried to expand um, examples of preceptor qualifications and we adjusted the, the categories and those kinds of things, the current academic and professional record doesn't exactly match now the new or the revised standards, so there's an updated academic and professional record that's out there. Um, we heard yesterday, and, and we've known that um, there's been work on moving the academic and professional record into farm academic, and we heard yesterday that that hope is to have that in the summer of 2023. I don't know for sure if that's gonna align with when the standard role, I don't know when summer of 2023 that looks like, but I will just say from a personal standpoint, I think it's nice to have the academic and professional record out there now because you're starting to prepare your preceptors to move to the new standard. And I think it would be a little bit challenging to, to wait if you were just waiting for it to, to be available in farm academic. Um, I'm also a visual person, so I like the academic and professional record because for me it looks like it's boxes and charts and that is helpful for me to see if, if things fit into compartments and, and those kinds of things. So if you're a visual person, you might like that academic and professional record as well. Um, I will just take a tiny sidebar and say for surveys, um, the academic and professional record, the, the updated academic and professional record will begin to be surveyed when programs are surveyed on the revised standard. So at the moment, if you have a survey coming up in the next, um, between now and the end of um, May, right, we still would be using the current academic and professional record, and then when you transition over to the new standards, June, end of June. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, the changes that you see in the academic and professional record, again, one of the other things is we tried to make it really clear how the academic and professional record and what pieces of the academic and professional record link back to which parts of the standard. So I think that was something that maybe wasn't totally obvious before, um, but to really look at that and say, oh, this exactly links up with 4.3 or those kinds of things like that. Um, so I think there's some enhancements that we tried to make with the academic and professional record to really make that link a bit more clear. And again, that led to some updated formatting, and I talked a little bit about the, the transition to farm academic, which I know we're all excited about. Okay, that finishes standard four. So moving into standard five, and, and you may have noticed that the current standard has six standards. The revised standard has five standards. Um, we really collapsed the current standard five in the current standards. Standard five in the current standards was really folded into other components of the revised standard. So that's why we went from six standards in the current to five standards in the revised version. Um, so standard five is pharmacy services. And just some very high level highlights with this, it's really divided into three sections. There's a pharmacy leadership section, there's a medication use system section, and then there's a patient centered care section. Um, some of the things that you see in pharmacy leadership have to do with the pharmacy scope and services, with the personnel in the pharmacy department. This is another area where we incorporated some concepts of diversity and inclusion and having the recruitment process of not just the residents, but also those that are working within the pharmacy department to reflect diversity and inclusion. Um, there's also some um, components that really align with some of our, our um, source documents like the PAI 2030 and some of our future looking, what does pharmacy look like in the next however many years? Um, so we incorporated some aspects of professional development in terms of advancing technician roles. Um, new also to the standard and in pharmacy leadership are some concepts that support well-being and really either using your organization's um, resources for supporting well-being and, and those types of things. But also under pharmacy leadership is our PD program administration time. So you'll see that is a new adjustment to the standard as well. So this is the first time that that is going to be in the standard. There's some guidance for what that looks like. And it will just say that that's just a starting point for since this is the first time that there has been our PD program administration time that's been introduced in the standard. We thought it should live in standard five under program leadership because RPDs need their department support to do that. Um, but also in terms of what that looks like, um, there's some more specifics and guidance. And then a bit about infrastructure and pharmacy leadership. In the medication use systems bucket, it, it really just kind of focused on making sure that pharmacy has oversight and authority for all things med use, right? And so policies and practices, information technology, automation and safety are all 
addressed in um, medication use systems in that section of Standard 5. And then patient-centered care um, really talks about the services that your pharmacy department is providing, and then likewise, what your residents are going to be doing, right? Because that's the environment in which they're training. Um, but making sure it's comprehensive, collaborative, it really takes a team-based care um, flavor to it in the, in the updated um, pharmacy services standard and also making sure that it's individualized and comprehensive for the patient. So um, team-based care and patient-centered care um, from that standpoint. So those are the big components of standard five as we look at pharmacy services. All right, that was a run through the standards in a very short period of time, but there's a lot of resources that are out there too. So if this is maybe the first time that you're looking at the revised standards or maybe you've been pouring through the standards, um, there's a lot of resources that are out there. Definitely look at the ASHP website. Um, those first three items, guidance. Um, so the standard is now published with guidance. And it is one in the same document. So you can't get the standards without the guidance. And you probably don't want the standard without the guidance because the guidance really gives a lot of how that standard is interpreted, how you might enact that standard within your program. Um, it also just tells you exactly what's going to be evaluated from an accreditation visit and, and those kinds of things. But one of the big things that we did, and, and, and this relates back to one of our big picture goals, but we really pulled a lot of information that was in the current standard in guidance and pulled that into the standard where it made sense. And we also really spent a lot of time when we revised the standard making sure that we expanded guidance and made sure that there were lots of examples. And it was something we needed to do as we harmonized the standards from all different program types into one. And we wanted to make sure that different program types and different practice environments were represented. Um, so you'll see a lot of work was done with guidance to, to really try to make it clear what the expectations are, how that standard um, is interpreted. Also on the website is the diversity resource guide. So um, I know Marjorie yesterday in the, the town hall really gave a shout out to those folks that worked really hard on the diversity resource guide. I'll give a second shout out. That is an incredible piece of work. If you haven't looked at it yet, take a look at it. It's right there, right by the new standards, right by the updated academic and professional record. And um, just, I'll also say my appreciation to that group that really looked and did a lot of research, research provided a lot of incredibly helpful um, ideas and suggestions. So if you're looking for ideas and suggestions of how to incorporate that or how to meet the standard or, or those kinds of things, definitely take some time and look at that diverse, diversity resource guide. Um, as I mentioned, the updated academic and professional form is also out there on the website. As we mentioned yesterday in the town hall too, um, we've got a well-being and resilience resource guide from ASHP that is almost ready to be hot off the press. So it's not quite up on the website yet, but it will. Um, so I think a lot of us are really anxious for that. Um, we also have a crosswalk that we did from the current standard to the new standard. If that is kind of the, the way that your brain works and you want to look at how, where was this in the current standard and where is this now in the, the new standard, the crosswalk is also almost ready and ready to, almost ready, not quite up on the website yet, but it'll be up there soon. So keep checking back on the website from that standpoint. Um, we've also been working very hard on creating some example documents. One of the example documents that we've been working hard on is an example template for the updated development plan. Not on the website yet, but it will be on the website soon. For those of you guys that were in RPDC, you got a sneak peek of what that might look like. Um, but there's also a lot of other pieces that, that we're working on updating. Um, if you're being surveyed, the, uh, the pre-survey packet, we're working on updating and those kinds of things like that. So um, when, once, we, once we put the standard, the revised standard out there, it kind of feels like our work didn't end. It really just picked up for all of these supporting educational and, and resources that, that we know that programs would like to have or that we think would be really helpful. Um, so the example documents that we're working on, as we get those ready, we'll put those up on the website. So that might be a little bit in more of a rolling fashion. And then under development would be a best practices guide. That's something that I think we were focusing a bit more on some of the other pieces. So that might be a little bit later coming through um, from that standpoint. 
So other resources, um, we did a session just like this at NPPC. Um, so if you were at NPPC and you're like, boy, those slides look real familiar, <laughs> you are correct. Um, it's the same slide set that we did at NPPC, um, clearly here at mid-year, and I believe this session is being recorded so that you can go back and, and take a look at it or that folks that weren't able to make it and that kind of thing. So we did some sessions at NPPC in mid-year. Um, we did record a webinar too that'll be released um, sometime in the beginning of the year that has more of a conversation of some of the updates of the standards, and so that's something that you can use as a resource. Um, I will always say the residency program design and conduct workshops, they have been totally redesigned to align with the new standard, and um, thank you if any of you in the room were at the, the workshops that were held on Sunday here at mid-year in person. Um, hopefully you got a lot out of them and found them very valuable. I think those of us that were um, presenting or part of the development also, uh, we, we thought that they were very, very helpful, so hopefully that was the case for you as well. If you didn't get a chance to do the in-person version, there's also some virtual offerings that'll be held in 2023, and I think those dates are still to be determined. Um, but that's always also a, a really great place to take a very deep dive into particularly Standard 3 and Standard 4. All right, so additional things that are coming with the standard revision. So um, critical factors, if you're wondering, hey, in the current standard, there's some critical factors, there's some bolded statements, but there aren't any bolded statements in the revised standard. Um, that's because those are in progress. So we're in progress of really looking at that whole process and how that works and, and all of that. Um, so as soon as we have the, the critical factors update, we'll put that out there on the website, but um, don't really think that's the critical factors are critical in your planning process of moving to the new standard. So we would wanted to get the, the new standards into your hands as soon as possible and, and not have it wait until we determine those critical factors. Additional steps is that um, now that we have completed the standard revision, um, the next up is the work on the competency areas, goals, and objectives in the revision process of each of those types. And again, um, work has already begun on that. Generally, the timeline for the updates of the CAGOs is shorter than the timeline of the update to the standard revision. Um, so we've already started to work on that, but it was also critical that we started to work on that because, as I mentioned, we had removed um, the required services that are in the existing PGY-1 community-based programs. We had review, removed that from the standard and moving those into CAGOs, so those CAGOs we wanted to get working on right away so that we didn't have gaps there. Um, and then additional steps is that Farm Academic has been very, very busy and doing an amazing job doing some builds to support the revised standards in CAGOs. Um, we talked a little bit about the APR. I know that there were some questions about, hey, is the development plan and the updates with the development plan, is that going to be ready in um, Farm Academic? And the answer to that is that is on the list and being worked on. But by the time you start and convert the new standards this summer, um, the way that the um, the way that the development plans are now, where you have a tab in Farm Academic and you upload the document, that's going to be the same for at least the first year of the new standards as well. So there's some work to to make it a little bit more automated. But for now, I think, and that's why people are looking for the templates of what that might look like, and that's what we'll have available um, from the website. So. Um, some enhancements to come and, and always things that we're working on. All right, I have done enough talking. So <laughs> I want to make sure that we, we open up the session to questions. I know folks have um, various questions that hopefully myself or um, our panel can answer as it relates to the new standards or maybe pr provide a little bit more context or that type of thing. But I'm, I'm first going to ask my panel, did I miss anything that was critical that we convey? I just wanted to um, we'll let you all know that we have confirmed the first virtual RPDC date for April 20th through 21st of 2023. So the fall date is um, still to be determined, but if you want to start planning, again, April 20th through 21st of 2023, that'll be the first virtual offering of the RPDC for the new standard. Hot off the press, you heard it here first. <laughs> All right, um, we'll open it up for questions, but again, just as a reminder, please come to the microphones um, so that we can hear and make sure that we're addressing the question that you're asking because we, we've heard it and, and that type of thing. So 
really looking forward to what you have to say. Hi, uh, Jenny Potbeside, VA Central Iowa. Um, if a resident attends mid-year and that attendance is tied to a learning experience like leadership professional development, will that still count as time away? Do you want me to answer that? <laughs> Go ahead. Conference attendance uh, would not be part of time away. It is. I would say conference attendance is part of time away. Uh, and so attending mid-year is would be counted as part of the time away. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, Julia West from uh, Greater Baltimore Medical Center, uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, my question is if you can just um, confirm, so if the new um, stand is that there is no longer a preceptor in training designation, so if I have a new preceptor uh, want to be coming up and they have just graduated and they possibly do not meet the requirements yet and they still do not have the experience, I'm saying, yes, you are a preceptor and here is your plan, even though they do not meet perhaps two-thirds of the qualifications. Is that what it tells me? So if you have a new, pre uh, new or existing preceptor who does not meet qualifications, um, then, then those would be not considered to be not um, fully compliant. So, you would need a training plan. Um, if it's just eligibility, which is a time thing, um, then there's no required training plan for eligibility because it's a it's a matter of time, right? <laughs> so, what are you going to put in the training plan? Except, you know, they'll be eligible in a year. Okay, so if they're not eligible, then it's not relevant, but if they're eligible and they still do not meet some of the qualification, perhaps experience-wise, so, so is this still okay with the development plan? I guess I'm just getting confused. So if your preceptor doesn't meet qualifications, technically, mm -hmm. well, you will not be, you know, you'll not be fully compliant with your preceptors yeah. meeting the standard. But then we also will... Um, if you have a preceptor who doesn't meet uh, does it not meet qualifications, we also do expect you to have a training plan, even though you're not going to designate them as preceptors in training. They would just need a training plan to help them meet those qualifications that they don't currently meet. Did that answer your question? It looks like maybe I didn't. Um, I guess not, but I will read the standard. Well, uh, I mean, I don't know if, like, does everybody understand I do want to clarify, or? you mentioned, I heard you say that eligibility, so that part wouldn't be relevant, but if you were surveyed and you did have a preceptor that did not meet eligibility, it would still be um, noted as a maybe partial compliance mm -hmm. in your report, so it is relevant in that sense. And then, like Andrea said, if you had a preceptor that did not meet the qualifications, as Julie discuss, then they would need a development plan, regardless if they were a new preceptor just coming out of residency, or if they were uh, established preceptor and maybe did not meet qualifications. So regardless, you still need a development plan, and okay. they have within two years to meet requirements. Okay. And then from there, I guess my follow-up question is, is there any, um, uh, thank you, is there any suggested or acceptable percentage of your preceptors that can be in this uh, category of not meeting um, qualifications that you would be okay with or there is no such thing as designating percentages? Yes, so if you know currently now, we, um, that's all related to critical factors. So we have, um, the critical factors do imply that. So you do have ratings of those critical factors to determine length of accreditation. So the quantity of preceptors, yes, that do not meet the criteria is a factor. So it's, I can't give you a percentage mm -hmm. now, but we will weigh that out um, when we are surveying and looking at your preceptors okay. overall. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Josh Mush, RPD with Mount Carmel Health in Columbus, Ohio. A uh, question regarding the days away from the program. If there's a teaching certificate component that is an elective rotation that takes the resident away for a teaching day at a university, would that count as an education day, so a day away from the program? 
So with that, you'd typically have a learning experience that would cover that, and that would be an activity that they would do or an expectation of that learning experience. So, so it would not count towards the day away from the program. But I will say that if there are too many of those things happening, right, so if you give comp days for staffing, that doesn't count for time away of the program, and too many of those kinds of things where you start to get in trouble with, or you start to get sort of borderline into, all right, now the resident isn't spending two-thirds of their time in drug patient care. That's where that would be captured, I guess I would say. Okay, so it needs to be tied into a specific learning experience. Yes. Thank you. Chris Thomas, Chillicothe VA. Um, with the 37-day time off, I'm really kind of curious on how the surveyors are going to actually survey that. I totally understand the purpose and you need to have a stop date of saying, okay, this is enough. But when, if I was a guest surveyor or main surveyor, how am I going to get to that data? It's probably going, uh, probably we'd get to that data mostly with discussion. Okay. Uh, you know, did you have any of your residents, you know, away from the program, you know, for more than 37 days? That's, and that's, that's, we're not going to be coming in and asking you for time cards yeah, or anything legally, like that. I don't think we're you going could. to be, it's going to be discussion. And I think that ultimately, I think it's causing a lot of angst, but I think it is one of those things that is a discussion, like you said, and if you have enough documentation, I don't think there's really much of an issue to it. So, and, but and maybe I'm a, just, so. And I, I do think this causes a lot of angst, but I think if you think about it, um, for most programs, how many of your, your, your residents are actually sick that much? Even in the VA, like Correct. your vacation, your holidays, that accounts for 23 days. So if your, your resident isn't extend, sick for an extended period of time, even we've looked at the data for most of your VA. Uh, so we looked at data actually at the height of COVID and actually the current standard for most of your VA residents, you know, even at the height of COVID with all the um, sickness, this, this uh, current standard would have been, it wouldn't have been impacted. I mean, probably less than 1% one, 1 of your residents would it have impacted at the height of COVID. So I think for most of you, I, I know it's a, I think it's, it causes angst because we didn't have any like time frame with, associated with the current record, uh, the current standard. You know, we needed a time frame be, for equity because some programs, because uh, the current standard said if it was beyond your paid leave, you had to extend the program. Some programs only had 10 days of paid leave. Right. And you know, if they had beyond that, they didn't have to extend the program. We had some programs that, well, at least one program maybe, that actually had three months of paid leave. So you know, it comes down to equity. So we had to come up with right. some type of uh, number. And we looked at a lot of data before we, and we looked at other programs like medicine before we came up with the data because in medicine, actually it's interesting because in medicine, um, AC, ACGME doesn't dictate uh, time off. It's dictated by the medical boards. And in medicine, um, only one program allowed more than 30 days off. So that's part of how we came up with it. And then we also, actually I don't know if y'all remember, but um, probably in one of your surveys in the last couple of years, you were asked, what was your maximum time off? What was the maximum of days away? So we really took a look at that data to look at the impact of whatever we did and how it would impact programs. That's how we came up with it. Well, and I appreciate the explanation. I think it's good for the group. I think for the VA it's hard because if we want to extend the program, it's not a local decision. It has to be done nationally. But I'll tell you, from a survey standpoint, if I have a resident that's at 38 or 39 days, I'm going to tell you they were 37 days and that's that. So. <laughs> hey, that's the way it is, so but I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I'd like to kind of speak to that because um, the first question that Chris asked was, how are we going to survey it? And, I, and we're not going to survey it any differently. We're surveying right now and looking at what your leave policy is, whatever it is, and then we ask questions about is there outlier and what are you doing with those outliers? So we're doing exactly the same thing going forward. What we're just saying is 
your leave policy cannot allow for more than 37 days without an extension. So we aren't gonna survey it any differently, it's just that we're clarifying that, that your leave policies cannot allow for them to be gone more than 37 days without an extension. Or if you happen to be a PGY-1 program that has a 53-week program already, you kind of get five bonus days because it's not a prorated sort of thing. Hi, good morning. Um, Darcy Aslett, St. Luke's Health System, Boise, Idaho. Um, so we have a um, progress report that will be due um, and the Commission on Credentialing will be reviewing in August of 2023. And so I was under the assumption that I'd be using the current standards that are on the books. Um, but I've also been advised that I could potentially, ad we could potentially adopt the new standards. Is there a penalty for doing that or what would your recommendation be? So um, with regards to standards, like standard one and two re related to policies, since um, most of the policies haven't changed significantly, um, if with their response, um, if you want to adopt policies that are in compliance with the 2023 standard, we will look at those and those will be perfect, you know, we'll count them as fully compliant if they're, if they're in line with the 2023 standard. Um, and, and so for the rest of it, we would probably review again, you against the current standard. Okay. So just to recap, so looking at standards one and two, um, with the upcoming 2023 20, standards, we could um, rely on the new, the new standards for standards one and two, and then for the remaining standards, our current, what's on the book, is that correct? Cor correct, because okay. actually standard three, there's very little change in okay. standard three, except for the addition of the self-evaluation to the development plan. Um, standard four, definitely you want to go with the current standard, because there's significant changes in okay. Until July 1st, 2023, you know, we'll be on the current standard. Okay. Thank you so much. Hey, Jen Engen, uh, Legacy Health in Portland, Oregon. I just had a question about um, standard three with the no more than two-thirds of their clinical time in one particular patient care area or population. Um, with regards to emergency medicine, is that its own patient care section or does that fall under critical care? So this is for a PG-1 program, correct? Yes, yep. For so for a PG-1 program, the standard really doesn't change between the current and the new standard, and it's no more than four months or one-third in a specific patient population. So if it was emergency medicine, your resident couldn't spend more than, you know, four months in emergency medicine. Sure, okay. So that's a separate from critical care kind of section. Yeah, but I think, yes. I think you're saying... Can you have like three months in emergency medicine and three months in critical care, and that wouldn't go over that one third, right? That's yeah. your question, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They are separate. Yes, cool. we do okay. consider critical care and emergency medicine to be separate. Fantastic. Okay, thanks. Hi, Mark Thomas from Cincinnati Children's. We're having an interesting struggle trying to meet one of the standards with the uh, residency disciplinary policy. Uh, we've worked with our HR and they're very hesitant about us having a separate policy that does exactly, essentially the same thing as the hospital policy. So they're really pushing back on us saying, we don't want you to have this separate policy. Just follow the policy we already have. Is there any recommendation? Well, I think the difference between following the normal HR policy and what the residency standards requires is really you know, some of the things regarding the residency standard is failure to progress. So what we're looking for you to do is define what constitutes failure to progress or maybe some other residency related items that would trigger a disciplinary policy. And then it's fully okay for you to say, you know, this is, you know, this is what we're defining for the residency as failure to progress. And if, you know, if it gets to a certain point, then we're going to our organization's disciplinary policy. We don't expect you to have a different disciplinary policy. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Hi, Scott Hall, Mayo Clinic Health System in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Can you guys help provide some clarity on what are or aren't considered duty hours based on how the current document reads? You know, right now it says all activities, clinical and academic, but seems to exclude any prep time. Um, so like, I have a grand rounds presentation that takes, it's scheduled for 45 minutes, but they do 15 hours of prep. It sounds like the prep wouldn't contribute to that. And likewise, you know, it also states, you know, excludes any hours that aren't explicitly scheduled by a preceptor or RPD. So, you know, if I have a rotation that's scheduled from 7 to 3.30, but the resident needs to come in at 5 o'clock to work up those patients, that two hours beforehand wouldn't count because I didn't tell them they needed to come in. So thanks for the clarification. Sorry, it's a really pedantic pharmacy question. I apologize. <laughs> I, I can take part of that and then we'll see if, if other folks, but I think the intent with that is that if a, let's say a resident is not familiar with a particular disease state and they go home and read about the disease state and those kinds of things, that does not get counted in the duty hours because that's sort of above and beyond in, in what they, they would need to do that for their residency, but, but from that standpoint, you're not asking them to, to do that and you're not counting that time and that kind of thing. I think that's the intent of some of those clinical and preparation activities or, or those kinds of things. Um, I don't know if, if you guys have anything to add to there. I'd add that actually, um, with regard to the DDR's definition, it's not, you know, as far as prep time, it's no different from the old DDR's definition. Um, so that re part really didn't change. And, and I would just add, um, if somebody comes in at five because they need to work up their patients, if I'm a surveyor, that's part of the learning experience. That's your expectation as a preceptor. So I guess I'm not quite clear what you're asking because if that's really what they need to do is come in to do the pre uh, evaluation of the patients before rounds, that feels to me like part of the learning experience and, and that would be part of the duty hours. No, sure, no, I, I definitely don't disagree with that. It just, just the way it reads, uh, at least in okay. my mind, is it seems like that if you're not explicit in what you're requiring to do, you know, every, every resident's different, obviously. Right, of and, course. And, you know, you, you can't say that everybody's gonna need X amount of time, but it, it, the way it reads is that I'm not explicit in telling you, you know, when, when you need to start and do that, then that time outside just wouldn't count. I think that is helpful. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Hi there, good afternoon. Maria Rojo from West Kendall Baptist. So similar to the question that was posed earlier about that interim report, for programs that are pending their reaccreditation sometime during that 22 slash 23 readiness period, what standards or how is that gonna be divided? The same as standard one, two, okay for the upcoming updates and then the other ones for the previous um, or the current standards. So for programs that are surveyed between now, well, have, who've been surveyed up until November 30th, um, outside of standards one and two, you, your response would be based on the current standard. If you're surveyed from December 2022 to the end of June, you know, if you're after December 2022 or December 1st, 2022, your program will be going to the August 2023 COC. So while you will prepare for your survey and you will be surveyed on the current standards, your response can reflect the 2023 standards. Does that make sense? A little bit. So, okay. <laughs> So basically, if you're surveyed from this point up to June 30th, 2023, which is you know, still on the old standard, mm -hmm. you prepare for the old standard, okay. your response can be based on the new standard. Okay. After July 21st, 2023, everybody's surveyed and response is based on the new standard. Got it. Thank and you. And I would just say, um, just globally, there are precious few things in the new standard, that if you change to the new standard, you would, you would somehow become non-compliant with the current standard. Precious, precious few. So um, I just wanna make sure people are clear about that. That's true. For example, just let me give you an example. 
if you're surveyed on the development plan and you're partially compliant, well, there's no self-assessment component with the current development plan, so you wouldn't have been cited on that, so you wouldn't need to address that in 2023 for your, with your response. Hi there. Uh, when, when will your readiness assessment survey be available for the new standards? Because when I fill it out now, I still have standard six and the documents necessary. So it gets a little confusing. Thank you. So we're currently, that's one of the documents that's under development. So the pre-survey packets, which will involve the, include the pre-survey questionnaire. So we, depending on the cycle, we will have to have those prepared probably at the first of the year, no later, because we already have notified you that your surveys. So, um, so that's what we're looking at, really the beginning of the year to have that incorporated into the pre-survey packets with that question. Hello, um, I'm just curious to know if burnout was a consideration when um, the standards were revised. Because a lot of times I'm seeing that our residents are burnt out, but most importantly our preceptors in the RPD is really burnt out. And kind of seeing that it's, ex it's expected that our program is miraculously in compliance with the new standards by the by what, June, you know? Um, and then now it's like five years, now it's down to four years. You know, and as an RPD, I want to get preceptors to be enthusiastic about precepting, but they're not. Because I am checking this, if the academic and professional form is not good, I gotta like send it back to them, do something. Did you do something? Oh, these are some of the things that you can do to qualify as a preceptor. And if we are expecting for preceptors to model great things to our residents for taking time for themselves, not eating in front of a computer, how are they gonna do that when the standards are not allowing that? And um, yeah, it's just, it's something that I think should go into consideration because it just seems like list after list after list after list. And then ASHP is making this big deal about burnout. And it's like the residents are burnt out. Unfortunately, I have to say it because of standards. So that's just my two cents. And I think that that's something to really consider um, to advocate for preceptors and programs, but most importantly, your RPDs. I have another question about the preceptor standards. Um, one of the things that a lot of our preceptors used to meet the qualification was work at an enterprise level, which we would interpret to be a vision or a national um, work group or policy or something like that. And that was removed from the preceptor standards. Um, and so it's created some frustration at a local level. And I was just curious why that was removed. That's a good question. I don't know that it was removed, but it was just changed the category that it counts for. So I think it counts for um, contribution to practice as opposed to role modeling ongoing professionalism. So it's still there, it's just been rearranged. Hello, um, my name is Laura Hobbs from Hartford uh, Hospital in Hartford, Connecticut. And I have a question about the 37 days off um, one of the uh, situations that we've had um, over the years is that grandparents sometimes die um, and our hospital policy provides three days off for a qualified relative for them to take off. And we send this, you know, bereavement document to invited candidates so that they know ahead of time. But um, I assume that the bereavement time would count as some of those 37 days but how do you plan it in? Like, I'm not expecting family to die, but um, it does happen, and it's already happened for one of my residents this year, so it just got me thinking about it. Let's say, you know, a grandfather died in October, and then we, you know, counted those three days in, but what if another relative died in May or June? Like, how am I gonna tell them, like, well, you get your bereavement days, but then you still have to make up those other three days, because you're, you know, right up at the 37 days. So. I was curious um, how we should plan ahead for something that is not guaranteed. We hope that they don't ever have to use their bereavement, but we do want to provide that time away for their well-being um, when that situation occurs. Thank you. 
That's a really good point. And, and obviously, we would not want anyone to deny bereavement leave based on the standard or things like that. But I, I think that would be a scenario where you would look at the cumulative number of days of time away. And if that has exceeded 37 by the end, or if 37 is what you have, and if that has exceeded that by the end of the residency year, then they'd either need to extend their residency program or they'd know up front from that standpoint. So that, that's why we want the, the leave policies to be provided to the residents when they're invited to interview. And I think it's the same as if you have, with your sick leave, you can't anticipate when you'll be sick or if, in the, if it's an extended illness, but you deal with the situation as it comes. So I think we can equate it to that as well, sick leave. Hi, Sandy Moreau from Jersey City Medical Center in New Jersey. Um, I have a couple questions surrounding the uh, new standard where uh, it's required for self-assessment every quarter from a resident. Uh, first part of my question is, um, up until now, in the beginning of the residency program, we have them complete the entering self-interest form of farm academic, which has career goals, Etc. Mm -hmm. um, we also send out the self-evaluation of all competencies and objectives. That's the baseline. Um, now that this is shifting to a quarterly, do you have advice on are we sending out the full competency objective self-evaluation quarterly? Is there going to be a different sort of template to self-assess on career goal changes, burnout in pharma academic, or are we using the self-interest form every quarter. And then, on, and then my sort of last part to this question is, our residents also self-evaluate on objectives at the end of every learning experience of the objectives in, in that learning experience. So there's a lot of self-evaluation. So what is your advice on how to sort of harmonize all of those? That's a really good question. Um, so a couple, a couple of pieces of that, right? Um, the new template that you may choose to use for the development plan incorporates all of those pieces of what do they need to self-evaluate on, what do they not need to self-evaluate. And so eventually some of those entering interest forms that are pre-programmed right now in Farm Academic will be updated and adjusted to reflect the new standard. Um, but the other piece of it is that your point about the residents self-evaluating at the end of each learning experience if that's something you want to choose to continue to do in your program, you can. It's not required by the standard. So maybe you take a look at that and say, hey, if, if we can cover some of this and, and what we're doing in the development plan quarterly, maybe we don't need to do some of those components or, or those kinds of things. So the summative self-evaluations were something that were in the previous standard as a requirement. In the current standard, the requirement for self-evaluation essentially got moved into the CAGOs where you had to teach and evaluate self-evaluation as an objective that you linked to a learning experience. And sometimes the activities people chose was to say, hey, they'll, they'll do a sum summative self-evaluation. That's the activity of how we taught self-evaluation. Um, but in the new standard, we've kind of moved that iteration of teaching the self-evaluation to make it part of the development plan. So there may be some pieces that you're currently doing that you evaluate to say, I don't know that we need to do that anymore, or, or those kinds. But, but I think if you take a look at the, when you can, when it's updated, the, the updated version of the template for the development plan, that will help sort of visualize how those pieces will come together um, from a self-evaluation standpoint. And then some work, like I said, will be done on a farm academic level to try to streamline some of that. But for 2023, that work won't be done yet. So we'll still be relying on like a, a paper document to be uploaded as it relates to the development plan. Understood, that's really helpful. Just one quick follow-up to that question, then um, I want to clarify the quarterly self-assessment. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that they have to self-evaluate themselves on every competency objective every quarter? No, right, just want it's, to clarify. Yeah, that. no, that yeah. is a really good point of clarification. And honestly, probably without seeing the template for the development plan, it, it, it's a little confusing. Um, but the assessment that's done quarterly as part of the development plan is at the competency area only. So there's only four competency areas, right? So you've got patient care, 
you've got leadership, you've got, um, you know, those kinds, so it's just those, those competency areas, not to the level of all 33 objectives or that kind of thing. Got it, thank you so much. And just a couple of additions, um, maybe to Julie's answers. The, you know, we have currently, there's a current uh, self, entering self-interest form and a, you know, an objective-based assessment done at the beginning of the residency. Um, that's currently being revised, and it's going to be one form, um, and it's going to incorporate both of those components. And, you know, right now, residents, you know, go through and they choose whether they're at the coaching level or at the experience level. Sometimes we see that, you know, you don't get much maybe information from that except, you know, it's a rating. So the entering self-interest will be, a, the entering self-reflection will also be at the competency level. So where do I feel my strengths and weaknesses are at the patient, you know, for patient care or time management, things like that. Um, so anything to add, Jim? Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, hi, Nick Edmonds from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. I have a question as it relates to the preceptor qualifications and um, eligibility. I think the new standard says the academic and professional record form needs to be reevaluated at least every four years. Is the expectation from the program that like if a preceptor submits their form today on the new standards and some of their examples are four years old, that next year they would no longer be compliant. Is the expectation that I review it or ask them to submit it again next year, or is it submitted and I can ask them again in four years? It's a good qu clarifying question, and I think some of it has to do with what your preceptor appointment, reappointment policy is. If it's something that you say it's, it's going to be annually, even though the standard only requires me to do it every four years so that I'm sure that all of my preceptors stay current, that's okay to do. Um, but it, it, it just depends on what your preceptor appointment reappointment policy is. And I'll defer to my surveyors as well. Yeah, and I would just add, uh, and maybe I'm reading into the question something that you're not adding, but the reality is, is the expectation is that the, res or the preceptors are always current in terms of their um, qualifications. So if they're fully qualified today and they don't do anything and we ask them in four years to update their APR, we know what will happen, right? We all know. And that is not the expectation of the new standard. So there ought to be a process to make sure that if the preceptors own that or if some committee or review group owns that, but. Their, the expectation is that they continue to maintain currency in terms of their uh, qualifications. So yes, they need to resubmit the following year. <laughs> well, they don't need not from they don't need to. But like if but you, the if expectation surveyed, is you yeah. decide, right? Okay. You decide if that's how your process to make sure they remain current. Yes. Hi, my name is Rebecca Grandy from Mayhack and Asheville, and I have a question related to, I'm sure, your favorite question around the 37 days. So, <laughs> so I guess my question is just, I would love to hear more about the thought process behind ASHP coming to the meeting, being included. And just for some context, um, we worked really hard at our institution with our GME department to make sure we have equity regardless of discipline. And so our medical residents this year just got an extra five days of PTO to be taken between Thanksgiving and the new year, recognizing they're overwhelmed, they're also overworked, well-being, burnout are an issue. So by default, pharmacy got that too, but now between our PTO sick days, granted hopefully people won't need all their sick days, but we also include mental health as part of our sick days. So between our PTO, holiday, sick days, coming to ASHP, bereavement, they could get up to 43 days off. And so I would hate to say, well, actually, pharmacy, we can't be the same as medicine because now we have this new requirement of 37 days. So for us, it feels like it's almost inequitable in our organization. And a lot of the work that we've been doing to help with mental health and wellness, it doesn't align with it. And so I'm curious, like, if you were to look at um, GME requirements for medicine, 
now versus when you surveyed it, if it would be different? Because I feel like there's been a lot of change in GME because of some of those issues. Anyway, so I think it would just be helpful for me to hear why ASHP meeting was included in that time off. Do you want me to take it? I could just make one comment. I think um, just to clarify, so it's okay that you, your organization may have the 43 days. It's just that, remember, because they're in that training program, we want to ensure that they are able, have sufficient time to achieve all of their objectives, the experiences. So then you would just want to, if they did, in a scenario, need those all 43, whatever you calculated, then extend the program to make sure, yes. So I guess like Devin's asking, if I come mid year time or residence at risk and need to extend, and I be a administrator, then I would need to extend the time off because I'm not going to be able to do the But then you also have in your, when you recruited, you provided what your program offered and your commitment to that resident, right? So you want to ensure and support their learning, which may have, you, you said you would support their conference. So would you want to take that away, you know, away or versus extending? Because you still want to show them that you're supporting, which helps with their well-being and, you know, to know that the program organization supports. So. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to comment, but I look at it like that. It's not. I think looking at standard 2 2 to Aquila's point, um, the uh, support for conference attendance and, and that type of thing is, is part of what you review with them when you invite them to come and interview with you. So it would be, I think, a little challenge if that's one of the things that you say is gonna be part of their residency program, but then don't offer that later. We, we actually, could you go to the mic to make your comments because we, we actually couldn't hear and I don't think the people in the back could hear either. I'm Gail Romanowski from Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego. And my point is, don't you look at that as part of an accomplishment in professional development if their poster is accepted at a meeting and why would that be counted against them in, in the 37 days? I'm just really struggling with that part. Again, it sounds like your resident probably had ex some extended, ex would have had extended illness in order to be close to that 37 days. So, and we did look at, I mean, so as we mentioned, we looked at the data, and for the most residents, we looked at what the impact would be at 30 days. And for most of your residents, they never get to that 30 days. The average time off, the maximum time off on average, away from the program when we, during the height of COVID was 20 days for all residency programs. So I say, you know, we're pharmacists and we worry about all those contingencies, but for most of you, it's not going to occur. And you also have to think about, it's a one year training program. There's gotta be some type of, you know, um, you know, minimum time that you're residents in the program and it needs to be equitable across all programs. And we'd actually, you know, we actually had initially a 30 day and we didn't count conferences, but um, because some of our federal programs, it's law that, you know, they get 37 days, we had to make some changes to our, our um, policy. And so we added the, it, we extended it to 37 days, but we included conferences. That's the thought process behind that. Yeah, so it really would have been 30 days and then seven days for conferences. So it, I think people are real thinking we're taking away the conference days when in fact 
That's not at all the case. What the draft initially was was 30 days maximum, and then the conference days would be on top of that. So, we, so now it's together, but if you think about it as 30 days plus seven conference days, which was our original draft, I think that will help you realize we aren't trying to take away those professionalism uh, development opportunities for the residents, but just trying to make sure, as both Akila and Andrea have said, we want to make sure that the resident isn't gone for three months of a 12-month residency program. Mm -hmm. That is not providing a full experience to the resident. I will also add just one thing to that. With the draft that went out last <clears throat> December, as Jim mentioned, it was 30 days and didn't include the conference time or things like that. And we got a lot of comments from the respondents that said 30 days is absolutely way too much. So that's another piece of it that we considered when we went through all of those comments was the vast majority of comments were there's no way we would give our residents 30 days of PTO kind of thing. So um, th think of, thinking about it from that context, I know it does sound awkward to have the time away packaged with conference time, but putting it together like that and trying to make sure that we came up with something that all of our programs could work with and then looking at the data to say, hey, if we enacted this today with the data that we have, how many residents would actually be affected by it? and seeing that it was very, very small to none, we felt comfortable with that decision. Hi, my name is Uriel Jimenez from Legacy Health in Oregon. My question is about the no more than one third of the patient care being in the same disease state or patient population. If I have a resident that has had a third of the residents in rotations in ICU, but towards the end, chooses to do a pediatric ICU, would that be okay because it's a different population or would that not be allowed? I think we don't know the answer. We, <laughs> to be honest, the three of us would survey this differently. <laughs> And my only comment was that you're thinking of the critical care population. So we've seen program structure where they have selective. So you have your ICU critical care, which is the disease or you know condition, but then you can let them decide, make you sick, you burn, trump, whatever, but it's critical care. That's the all-encompassing. So if you want to think of it that way as well. Hi, um, my name is Howard. I'm from Santa Rosa Memorial Hospital in Northern California. Um, and I had two questions, if that's okay. Um, the first one was just regarding the time away, um, some of our, our, our program has a teaching certificate where sometimes our residents will end up going off from the rotation for that day mm -hmm. to do a teaching certificate. Would that count against them during that time frame? Generally, that teaching certificate is part of a learning experience, that, right? Correct. So yeah. that's part of their training. Okay. So no, it wouldn't. Okay. Um, and then I guess the second question is uh, regarding policies and procedures. I think everyone here is aware that a lot of our hospital systems are under financial stress and things that we put into our policies as things that we are planning to do occasionally kind of get yanked away from us from far above beyond any capacity that we can, um, that we can adjust, like influence. Um, and w if that happened, would that count against us? Uh, can you maybe repeat that question? We weren't sure we followed. Oh, sorry. Um, so, you know, in our policies, for instance, like in a, uh, from the handbook, when we say we're going to pay for, um, uh, like, you know, ASHP or something. I'm not saying that this is happening this year, but possibly down the road. Um, if there's like a ban on travels, you know, from far above us from administration, but that was never, like, we intended to honor our commitment to that. Um, but it is something that we are blocked from higher above. Would this count against us? By count against you, do you mean like in a survey? Yeah, or something like that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would say the short answer is yes. But if you read the, um, uh, the guidance around this in the standard, it really talks about communicating clearly what 
you are offering. If you don't know, because you don't know if your organization is going to fund the residents going to the mid-year, you need to be upfront with the residents about that. You say, we don't know if the residents will be able to be funded to go to the mid-year. If they are, great. But, but you just need to be upfront about what you can provide. And, and I think that the, the point is, that if, if you have committed to that and the organization says no more, then I think there needs to be a conversation from the pharmacy leadership to the organizational leadership about this is a commitment that we have made to these trainees. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Time for another one. Um, thank you for this lively forum, by the way. I'm Jenny Seifer, and I'm with The Ohio State University College of Pharmacy. I'm an RPD for the community-based program, and we've talked about the rewriting of the KGOs. And so my question is a little bit around the timeline, maybe who's making up the work group around that, and what are the opportunities for our preceptors and RPDs to provide input to that rewrite of the KGOs? Yes, so I think collectively we've been talking about timelines, and um, so what we wanted to do in, um, oh my, Jen, Julie, I'm, thinking all J name. So Julie just presented at the bottom of that one slide that the community KGOs were looking to go first, right, because of the changing of the approach to the services. Um, so right now we do have a core group that is stemmed from the commission, which is a very diverse, but um, we do have a plan to recruit, I'll say like experts in each practice area as we dive into the specific um, KGO, so for community-based, for managed care, for the PGY-2, so similar to our previous KGO process. Um, so timeline, that is a little tricky, but I will let you know that right now, because we just finished the standard, but we are entering that, and so as we get a more definitive timeline, we will give updates. But yes, to speak to your point, there will be an expert panel, um, and I'm not so sure about the opportunity for collectively to feedback for everyone to contribute because the previous process that was not the case we didn't have an open forum because we did select carefully those experts that made up the um, panels that went into developing those so probably that similar process but um, we will continue to update with the timeline so right now just to let everyone we're working on a core group that will be like the core kegos for transcending all program types but there will be expert panels as we get more specific down the line. Okay, thanks Akila. Yeah. Hi, my name is Julia. I'm from the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I was hoping to get some clarity on the preceptor and training designee. Um, so if that's getting removed, is that also getting removed, I'm assuming, in pharmacademic as well? Um, and it is not. So, yes, okay. <laughs> it, is, it is not. Oh, it is not, okay. It is not. So the functionality, I, sorry, I didn't mean to cut off no, your question, thank you. but, thank you. but, but, and that is something I should have clarified when, when I presented that I know a lot of folks use that functionality because it, it's really slick, right? You can assign somebody a coach and, and take a look at their evaluations. So that functionality is not going away in farm academic. You can still use that. Okay. So preceptors who um, don't necessarily meet qualifications and are in that um, time period where they're in the midst of their development plan or training plan mm -hmm. are still able to precept in that time period as long as they have a training plan in place, correct? So we, if we were to survey you and you had preceptors, even if they had a training plan who didn't meet qualifications, it would be an area of partial compliance. But you still have a, you have a training plan, so you have a plan for them to meet. Um, and you know we're still working on critical factors and how we're evaluating that. But I don't see it being any much different. I don't see it, uh, I'll say. But right now, if, if, if you know, more than, if, if um, two-thirds of your, or if, if more than one-third of your preceptors meet qualifications, it, it doesn't impact your accreditation length. I, I don't see that changing, probably. So you can have some preceptors, you know, that, don't meet qualifications, and if we come and we cite you on it, 
it's not going to impact your accreditation length. So it's up to you on whether you want to keep them as preceptors. And I'd say, you know, you should think about it. If they're great preceptors, even if we're going to cite you on it, you know, it's a best, it's an optimal standard. And, and we're, so if you have a preceptor you think should, you know, is the best person to precept, you know, I would take a hit on it if I was the pre RPD. <laughs> Because okay. it won't impact your accreditation unless you're really, most of your preceptors don't meet it, and that's usually not the case for most organizations. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm asking this question because my group has asked me to ask this question, but <laughs> <laughs> um, with the APR, um, is the goal of the APR to promote the development of preceptors who stand as examples to the profession as well as personal well-being, or promote preceptors who stand as an example of the profession in their entire life is pharmacy and precepting their residents. Can you repeat your question? <laughs> I, I, I want to make sure I understand and answer. Uh, the current APR, the way it stands, mm -hmm. a lot of my preceptors are finding difficulty in trying to meet the standards of the APR and in, in promoting the standards of that APR and also maintaining their personal well-being. I think there's one section in your participation in well-being. And so they're not standing as examples of well-being while meeting these requirements because all of the requirements are pharmacy, their, their external um, contributions, you know, with their missions and their, you know, their groups that they volunteer externally need to be a part of pharmacy or a part of healthcare, right? And so now all these things they do as members of the community don't necessarily count as that. So I guess I'm, I'm struggling, my group is struggling with what are we promoting with the APR, that these, they stand as examples of pharmacy and personal well-being, or they stand as examples of pharmacy preceptors? I think, to an I think I'm answering your question. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I, no, no, no. I'm but butchering if, how they told me nope. to ask this question. That's okay, I, I think what you're asking is related to the role modeling of the professional engagement, yep. right? And so it's specifically um, called role modeling professional engagement in the practice or in the profession. So the APR is taking, or the standards are taking a look at how somebody role models professional engagement in the profession. It doesn't exclude well being or any of those kinds of things, but it's talking about how somebody role models professional engagement in the practice of pharmacy. So was there consideration taken into how they role model that professional engagement and also maintain well-being? Are they mutually exclusive? I, don't, I, don't I guess know. for me, I, I guess uh, I don't. and a lot of my preceptors, maybe I'm the only one struggling with this in my program and personally. Um, but yeah, I guess we're struggling with that a great deal right now. Yeah. I don't know that I can directly answer your question, but if you step back from it and think about it, there's in that role modeling professional engagement, I mean, it's three activities in four years. And so just think about that. Okay, thank three you. Three activities okay, thank in you. four years. I'd also say that there are things that they can do in that area that um, while they're at work, I mean, they can be part of a residence project that counts. They can. Um, offer, you know, a presentation on preceptor development. So they don't ha necessarily have to do a lot of things outside of, you know, pharmacy or their health system or wherever you work, your organization, to meet those. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for your time. I just have a clarifying question. Are the new standards uh, reflected in all PGY1, PGY2 programs or do you follow your, like I have an EM program, so do I have my EM KGOS that I need to follow in addition to these new standards or will they be reflected? So the standards and the KGOS are two different things. The standard, the or, new standard will apply to all programs. Okay. And then all programs will also have to follow their specific KGOS. So That's yes, right. your emergency medicine will have to meet the KGOS. But those are, those will, that will be judged you know, by the standard. Yeah, so that's, I guess that's what I meant to ask, is that you have like two sets of accreditation criteria that you need to follow, basically, if you're an EM 
or if you're like in a specialized field? Well, it's the same as it is currently. Like if you have the PGY, you have the PGY two standard, right? And your K goes, you know, play into the PGY two standard. Um, you have the PGY one standard. Now you just have one standard that is harmonized across all programs, okay. but each program will have to, um, okay, you know, follow the. They'll have to ensure all their objectives, you know, are incorporated into mm -hmm. the program to fully meet the standard. That makes sense. Thank you. I, I, I was going to say, we're about seven minutes over already, so maybe we'll take these last two questions. But, but for those of you that have to get going to other things, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for attending our session. Um, thank you for your questions, for your thoughtful feedback, and for your dedication to residency training. And we can maybe take your two questions personally on the side. Sure. Would that be okay? Sounds good. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.